First, I thank the organizers for their amazing hard work in bringing this off and for including me. My name is Deborah Winslow. I'm not an archeologist, I'm a cultural anthropologist, so I am learning a lot. The title of my paper is Reinventing the Wheel, Perpetual Innovation in Singhalese Potter Assemblages. My focus today is on Walangama, a community of potter caste people in Sri Lanka. When you walk down Walangama's lanes, you know immediately that this is a place where potters live. Pot shirts crunch under your feet. As you look around, you see pottery everywhere. Some is piled, waiting. Some is being loaded into lorries to transport it throughout the island. When you venture into someone's garden, you find potters at work, such as this woman at her wheel, throwing pots off a hump. But then you notice something unusual. In addition to potter's wheels, there are mechanical presses. You can see one in the background of the woman's workshop. At another house, you see one in action, molding pots rather than throwing them. And you wonder, why are there two methods of making pottery? This paper is one answer to that question. It is a story of the evolution of pottery making technologies in a particular place over time with in influences from different scales of human activity. Our story begins in the early 20th century. Now today, Walangama is a village of about a thousand people, heavily dependent on making and selling terracotta pottery. But if you could time travel back a hundred years, you would find yourself in a smaller community, perhaps just a thousand, hundred people, with a subsistence system far less focused on pottery, despite their inherited caste identity as potters. Then they were first of all rice farmers, who grew irrigated rice on their own land, which they celebrated with Buddhist rituals on the threshing floor. Second, they had gardens in which they grew dry grains and vegetables using land owned by the government. Only third did they make pottery, which they sold in nearby villages and markets or by occasional bullet cart trips to other areas of the island. This economic diversity was crucial. Wollongama's agricultural land base was insufficient, even for such a small village. Furthermore, they lived in an area of unreliable rainfall, where sometimes there was only one monsoon a year instead of two. The ups and downs on the graph illustrate this rainfall variability. But the mix of strategies worked. Their three-pronged system, irrigated rice, garden vegetables and grains, and pottery, appears to have supported them for generations. And then, in the middle of the 20th century, this nicely tuned system collapsed. By 1948, which was the year that Sri Lanka, then Ceylon, became independent from Great Britain, the community was in dire straits because of the unfortunate convergence of three different factors. One, Walangama's population had increased to over 400 people without an increase in their agricultural base. Two, the government had reclaimed their garden lands to sell for coconut estates, so Walangama no longer had gardens for food. They also had, three, they also had very limited pottery markets. During my first re field research in Walangama in the 1970s, when people told me stories of the 1940s, they always described it as a time of poverty and crowding, too many people, too little food, too few houses. Luckily for Walangama, the first governments of independent Sri Lanka continued the social welfare policies that the British had supported in the early 20th century. This social welfare ethic meant that when Walangama people approached their new member of parliament for help, he saw it as his job to give it to them. In fact, the new government had a special program to help those, quote, engaged in village pottery, end quote. So at the member of parliament's request, the government sent a trained pottery demonstrator named Albert Pereira to help Walangama. When Mr. Pereira arrived, he saw that Walangama potters were using floor wheels, pivoted block wheels. These were solid wooden wheels with a stone pivot affixed to the underside 
which turned in a stone socket embedded in the ground, or sometimes the floor of a house. Mr. Pereira brought in wheels that we will call high wheels. Wangama people just call them pottery wheels. The high wheel itself was about the same size as the floor wheel, but it was supported on a wooden frame instead of being balanced on a pivot. The wheel was attached to a steel shaft, which turned in a ball bearing race. Like the floor wheels, they were hand spun. Nonetheless, the high wheels had several advantages. They sustained longer, faster, and less wobbly spins. Their height was more comfortable for the potter, and they were also easier for a single potter to use working alone. There was an immediate improvement in productivity. Mr. Pereira's records show an increase of at least 25% in the first two or three years after the new wheels were introduced. The government had intended that the potters would buy the wheels from Mr. Pereira, but they were too expensive. So villagers learned to make them for themselves using methods similar to those they used for the old floor wheels. In fact, while the high wheels were an improvement, they were not a radical change in the overall technology. They fully engaged the traditional assemblage of supporting systems. Brian Arthur, in his book, The Nature of Technology, defines technology as an assemblage of practices and components in support of a means to a human purpose. The high wheels used many of the same practices and components as the floor wheels. They used the same base principle, centrifugal force to shape clay to make pottery. The wheel was carved as before, the clay was still dug locally and trampled to integrate moisture, and they employed the same overall production strategy, throwing pots to fix the mouth and shape the walls, allowing the half-shaped pots to dry to leather, using paddle and anvils to extend walls to make round bottoms, and firing in shallow pit kilns. The next two slides illustrate some of these practices and components. In the first one, the two pictures on the left show a wheel being carved from wood that is taken from the buttress root of a tree, and you can see the hole that taking that wood out leaves. The second two show the clay being dug locally and transported by cart to the workshop. The two pictures on the right show the clay being integrate, trampled by foot to integrate moisture. In the next slide, a woman and an assistant are shaping a large pot on the top left. And then the bottom left, you see pots drying to leather. Paddle and anvil finishing is being used to extend and thin the walls of the pot in the middle slides and form the round bottom. And in the two slides on the right, you see the pit kiln being fired and a woman opening the kiln after firing. The new wheels were a success, but they did create a few problems and the potters responded. So here are just two examples. There are more in my paper. For one thing, more pots meant more pots to sell. The old system of bullet carts and human carrying was inadequate and in any case, the local markets were not sufficient. The potters wanted to buy a truck, a lorry, but the cottage industry supervisors would not allow them to do so. So they learned to rent lorries cooperatively and some village men learned how to be traders. This solved their sales problem. Another problem was that pots, more pots also meant more clay. Now the government had introduced price supports for rice farming. So farmers became unwilling to continue to allow potters to dig clay from their fields. They were afraid of the crops being damaged. So the government helped the potters again by buying, by giving them funds and, and, and um, land where they could buy a field just for clay. Thus, Wallangama developed a new multi-pronged subsistence system, primarily pottery, secondarily government services, free rations, free schools, and health care, plus some rice farming. The 1960s and 1970s were a difficult time in Sri Lanka. It was a time of shortages, unemployment, and urban unrest. The government was trying to protect the local economy, and they had instituted strict, strict controls on all imports. But Wallangama potters were doing fine. 
on the whole, and they managed to be in the top third in household income nationally. This was the system I first encountered. It seemed to me stable, almost timeless, and then it shifted again. Beginning in 1978, there was a major macroeconomic shift in the national Sri Lankan economy. Wollongama pottery technology adjusted again. This shift came about because in 1977, the people of Sri Lanka were so tired of import substitution shortages, they voted in a government that promised to open up the economy. The new government reduced social spending and increased infrastructure spending to attract foreign investment. UNESCO reported soon thereafter that there was rising inflation, rising unemployment, rising child malnutrition, rising urban poverty. But when I returned to Walangama in 1989 and 1992 for another period of extended fieldwork, I found that the village was doing well. Like other artisans, the potters had benefited from more money in the economy and more availability of transport. Pottery prices had kept up with inflation, as you can see on this graph. There were new houses and other signs of prosperity. I also discovered that they had added a new hot pot to their repertoire. The first major infrastructure project that the new government undertook was a series of dams to provide electricity and irrigate thousands of acres of land in an area located about 100 kilometers north of Wollongama. Expanded in irrigation increased both rice farming and dairy farming. In Sri Lanka, dairy products are consumed primarily as powdered milk and as curd, a kind of yogurt. Curd is made and sold in clay pots, which are thrown away after the curd is consumed. Traditionally, the curd and the curd pots were made on Sri Lanka's south coast, as you can see in this map. After the dams were built, some curd producers from the south moved north to take advantage of the dairy expansion. At first, they continued to import pots from the south, a distance of over 200 kilometers. Wollongama traders saw what was happening and realized that they could undercut the southern cut curd pot producers if they could get Wollongama potters to make curd pots. After all, Wollongama was much closer to this newly developed area. Wollongama potters did not traditionally make curd pots. Curd pots are considered inferior pottery. The pots are made crudely because they're only being used once. And you can see in the curd pot on the right that they're actually intrusions in the clay because it hasn't been cleaned properly. But even though they didn't make curd pots, they did make a similar pot, the atelier, which is used for cooking curries. So when the traders gave them incentives to learn, they learned to make curd pots pretty quickly. Too quickly, as it turned out. The demand for curd pots was unlimited. The human body was not. In 1992, when I was doing research, I heard the sounds of pottery making last thing when I went to sleep at night and first thing when I, I woke each morning. Because of this unremitting labor, the potters complained to me of knees swollen from trampling clay, backs aching from paddle and anvil finishing, numbing boredom from endless hours of making the same pot. I timed a friend. She could make a curd pot on the wheel in 15 seconds, turning out one after another, like potato chips, she said. So community leaders looked for a solution. Building their new houses had introduced them to the roof tile industry. They then learned that it was possible to use the roof tile molding technology to make pots. So they worked with a local machine shop to develop molds and machines to make curd pots. This solution was so successful that 10 years later, in the early 2000s, I could not find a single hand-thrown curd pot in the village. Today, although traditional pottery is still made, about half the households are involved in the curd pot industry and the village is turning out perhaps a million curd pots a month. This was a radical change, a new base principle, pressing clay into a mold rather than using centrifugal force and thro with throwing it. And this novel technology 
called forth novel supporting technologies. The new technology created new problems and required new solutions. Here are a few examples. The molded pots use more clay. Endless trampling of this clay produced swollen knees. So slowly they developed a clay mixing machine. A second example. The mold machines are expensive. So traders bought and lent machines to potters. Eventually there developed a market for used machines so the cost went down. Third example, the household mode of production could not meet demand. So some households employed outside workers, teenagers, newlyweds who could not afford their own mold machines and so on. Because it was less skilled work, some even employed non-potters from nearby villages. So if those were new problems requiring new solutions, the new technology also provided new solutions for old problems. For one, throwing pots on a wheel is a messy business, and it's always been hard to combine with the needs of infants and toddlers. You have to wash thoroughly in order to get up to tend a crying baby and so on. So younger parents appreciated the relative neatness of mold machines and the willingness of traders to lend machines and supply raw materials. The demand for curd pots was so high that it was worth the traders while to do this for a very small reduction in payment. My second example of an old problem to which curd pots provided a new solution is cast. Potters felt that higher casts looked down on them. It was an old concern. But pottery making was now becoming more of a business and less of an identity. Traders went directly to the potters' houses to collect the pots. The potters did not have to deal with consumers face to face. The dairies buy from potter traders and non-potter traders. In this slide, the, the potter trader is loading pots in Wallangama. The pots in the middle are the ones that he unloaded at a commercial dairy and they're being used in that dairy on the right. Those users have no idea who made them or where. It provided the anonymity that the potters wanted. To conclude, as I see it, the potter's wheel exists in a nexus of national, regional, local, and individual systems, relationships, affordances, and limitations. To understand the evolution of Wollongong's pottery technology, I considered factors that operate at multiple scales. At the highest scale, the wheel use was affected by a sequence of changes in the national political economy, from socialism to import substitution to structural adjustments and liberalization. At the regional scale, we saw that Wallangama had to assure access to clay, space to work, and markets. At the local scale, we touched briefly on interactions between pottery making and concerns about household life, household modes of production, and caste. Finally, at the smallest scale, we had to take into account the individual potter's body. All of these had to be considered for the evolution of Wallangama's wheel use to be understood. We also saw that their technological system was never perfect. It always had stress points that required solutions and planted the seeds for change and more change. In a sense, Wallangama has taught me that Brian Arthur is right. Technology is a means to a human purpose, not a purpose in itself. Technological evolution is ongoing, never static. The hand-turned potter's wheel is a temporary stop along the way. It is still used for traditional pottery in Wollongama, but it failed to meet the challenge of mass production. And so today, there are two methods of making pottery in Wollongama. Thank you. Thank you to everyone listening. Thank you to the people of Wallangama, to my field assistants, and to my generous supporters. Thank you.